Hello, Karen here. Welcome to another episode of Comfortably Dressed Radical Feminist Reading Hour. Get your coziest robe and sweatpants on because we're going to be reading from The Great Cosmic Mother. We'll be reading the essay, The First Sex. This essay is considered part of goddess feminism and it's a multidisciplinary exploration of women uh, in religion, mythology, anthropology, stuff like that. Despite it being goddess feminism, which is kind of woo, uh, for whatever reason, a few men have told me they really, really enjoyed this essay. I don't know. Goddess feminism doesn't get talked about much within the younger uh, gender critical radical feminist circles. Maybe because when you're focused on ensuring biological reality isn't erased, it doesn't seem like a good time to talk about what it means like psychically and mythologically to be female. And to be sure, some of this academic feminism did pave the way for the trans movement's uh, ability to make really bizarre claims. Goddess feminism really wasn't something that I thought would be very appealing to me. And when I looked up this book on Amazon, the sponsored suggestions were books about crystals. So that's probably why I assumed that this wasn't for me. But I, I have a hunch that if we wade through the woo and we discard the outdated and erroneous stuff, we might find some answers within this sphere of feminism to questions about, you know, what the relationships between men and women should be like, or what female sexuality should be like. Though I consider myself an atheist, as I get older, I can see more and more how much religion matters, or at least what matters about religion hasn't been adequately offered outside of it for most people yet, um, especially in the fight against the spread of what some of you will call neoliberalism, some of you will call capitalism, but I mean, really, I think the part about it that matters, or what I'm referring to, is kind of all human and natural relationships becoming commodified and transactional, and no purely secular movement thus far has been able to limit that. Um, so I do, I do think the idea of feminist religion, in a sense, is important, and it's not really something that people are um, working on as much or is talked about very much, but I, I do think that this kind of thing is important to the longevity of feminism. This essay is the first time I personally came across the notion of a pre-patriarchy, um, like a supposed time where women were um, lightly considered superior and worshipped, and there was kind of an overall egalitarianism. Um, to be honest, I'm not checking the sources of this essay, and I haven't read the rest of the book, and I don't really know how true this pre-patriarchy thing really is. Um, I've definitely read about it a lot um, in other feminist texts. I think that it's kind of a general belief of, of feminists that that either patriarchy began like in full swing with, you know, your Abrahamic religions, or if you're talking to a Marxist feminist with the beginning of agrarian societies and the passing on of wealth from father to son. I don't know. I don't know if, I, I don't know. But Brett Weinstein talks about this idea of metaphorical truth in religion, which is like things that aren't strictly factually true, but if a group acts as if they were true, it confers an advantage to the group because it results in positive behaviors. If pre-patriarchy is a myth, I think it would fall into this category of metaphorical truth, because I do think that it's an important myth, if it is a myth, that it's 
if you believe that men and women can be that they have in the past lived in an egalitarian societies, then you believe that there's a future where that is possible too. So you won't be a total asshole to every man and you can still see their humanity. And I think that that's good. I think that that is positive for feminism. I think it's positive for a person individually, a woman individually. And I think that it's positive for the relationships between men and women, obviously. A little bit about the authors before we begin. Monica Sue was, according to Wikipedia, a Swedish painter, writer, and radical anarcho-slash-eco-feminist. She wrote a pamphlet that was expanded by Barbara Moore into this book, The Great Cosmic Mother. The heavy lifting of The Great Cosmic Mother, going from this short pamphlet to a 500-page volume, was mainly on Barbara Moore, who was a beat poet turned into a uh, goddess feminist who again, according to Wikipedia, became a uh, destitute and homeless bag lady due to the high publication costs and slow release of royalties from the publisher, even as the great cosmic mother was taught in women's studies classes across the country. I wish we could know more about that, about why she wasn't um, better supported by the feminists in her area, but I guess we'll never know. So let's just enjoy her essay. The first sex. In the beginning, we were all created female. In the beginning was a very female sea. For two and a half billion years on Earth, all life forms floated in the womb-like environment of the planetary ocean, nourished and protected by its fluid chemicals, rocked by the lunar tidal rhythms. Charles Darwin believed the menstrual cycle originated here, organically echoing the moon pulse of the sea. And because this longest period of life's time on Earth was dominated by marine forms reproducing parthenogenetically, he concluded that the female principle was primordial. In the beginning, life did not gestate within the body of any creature, but within the ocean womb containing all organic life. There were no specialized sex organs. Rather, a generalized female existence reproduced itself within the female body of the sea. Before more complex life forms could develop and move onto land, it was necessary to miniaturize the oceanic environment to reproduce it on a small and mobile scale. Soft, moist eggs deposited on dry ground and exposed to air would die. Life could not move beyond the water-hugging amphibian stage. In the course of evolution, the ocean, the protective and nourishing space, the amniotic fluids, even the lunar tidal rhythm, was transferred into the individual female body, and the penis, a mechanical device for land reproduction, evolved. The penis first appeared in the age of reptiles about 200 million years ago. Our archetypal association of the snake with the phallus contains, no doubt, this genetic memory. This is a fundamental and recurring pattern in nature. Life is a female environment in which the male appears, often periodically and created by the female, to perform highly specialized tasks related to species reproduction and a more complex evolution. A freshwater crustacean reproduces several generations of females by parthenogenesis. The egg and its own polar body mate to form a complete set of genes for a female offspring. Once annually, at the end of the year's cycle, a short-lived male group is produced. The males specialize in manufacturing leathery egg cases able to survive the winter. Among honeybees, the drone group is produced and regulated by the sterile daughter workers and the fertile queen. Drones exist to mate with the queen. An average of seven drones per hive accomplish this act each season, and then the entire male group is destroyed by the workers. Among whiptail lizards in the American Southwest, four species are parthenogenetic. Males are unknown among the desert grassland, plateau, and chihuahua whiptails, and have been found only rarely among the checkered whiptails. Among mammals, even among humans, parthenogenesis is not technically impossible. 
Every female egg contains a polar body with a complete set of chromosomes. The polar body in the egg, if united, could form a daughter embryo. In fact, ovarian cysts are unfertilized eggs that have joined with their polar bodies, been implanted in the ovarian wall, and started to develop there. This is not to say that males are an unnecessary sex. Parthenogenesis is a cloning process. Sexual reproduction, which enhances the variety and health of the gene pool, is necessary for the kind of complex evolution that has produced the human species. The point being made here is simply that, when it comes to the two sexes, one of us has been around a lot longer than the other. In The Nature and Evolution of Female Sexuality, Mary Jane Scherfey, M.D., described her discovery in 1961 of something called the inductor theory. The inductor theory stated that all mammalian embryos, male and female, are anatomically female during the early stages of fetal life. Scherfey wondered why this theory had been buried in the medical literature since 1951, completely ignored by the profession. The men who made this history-making discovery simply didn't want it to be true. Scherfey pioneered the discussion of the inductor theory, and now, with modifications based on further data, its findings are accepted as facts of mammalian, including human, development. As Stephen Jay Gould describes it, the embryo in its first eight weeks is an indifferent creature, with bisexual potential. In the eighth week, if a Y-chromosome-bearing sperm fuses with the egg, the gonads will develop into testes which secrete androgen, which in turn induces male genitalia to develop. In the absence of androgen, the embryo develops into a female. There is a difference in the development of the internal and external genitalia, however. For the internal genitalia, the fallopian tubes and ovaries, or the sperm-carrying ducts, the early embryo contains precursors of both sexes. In the presence or absence of androgen, as one set develops, the other degenerates. With the external genitalia, the different organs of male and female develop along diverging lines from the same precursor. This means, in effect, that the clitoris and the penis are the same organ, formed from the same tissue. The labia majora and the scrotum are one, indistinguishable in the early embryonic stages. In the presence of androgen, the two lips simply grow longer, fold over, and fuse along the midline, forming the scrotal sac. Gould concludes, the female course of development is, in a sense, biologically intrinsic to all mammals. It is the pattern that unfolds in the absence of any hormonal influence. The male route is a modification induced by secretion of androgens from the developing testes. The vulnerability of the male newcomer within the female environment is well known. Vaginal secretions are more destructive to the Y-bearing sperm. The mortality rate is higher among neonate and infant males. Within the womb, the male fetus, for the first two months, is protected by being virtually indistinguishable from a female. After that, it must produce large amounts of the masculinizing hormone in order to define itself as male, to achieve and to maintain its sexual identity. For all we know, the Near Eastern myths upon which our Western mythologies are built, those which portray the young god or hero battling against a female dragon, have some analog here. In utero, where the male fetus wages a kind of chemical war against re-becoming female. For now, it is enough to say that maleness among mammals is not a primary state, but differentiates from the original female biochemistry and anatomy. The original libido of warm-blooded animals is female, and the male, or maleness, is a derivation from this primary female pattern. Why, then, did the medical men, the scientists, take longer to figure out this basic biological fact than it took them to split the atom? And why, once this fact was noted, did they turn around and bury it in professional silence for ten years until a woman dug it up again? Why, indeed? For about 2,000 years of Western history, female sexuality was denied. When it could not be denied, it was condemned as evil. The female was seen as divinely designed to be a passive vessel, serving reproductive purposes only. In one not-too-ancient dictionary, clitoris was defined as a rudimentary organ, while masculinity equaled the cosmic generative force. With Freud, female sexuality was not so much rediscovered as pathologized. Freud dismissed the clitoris as an undeveloped masculine organ and defined original libido as male. Clitoral eroticism was reduced to a perverse neurosis. Even after Masters and Johnson's laboratory studies were published in Human Sexual Response in 1966, their findings were not integrated into psychoanalytical theory. 
In Mary Jane Sherfy's research during that period, she found not one work of comparative anatomy that described, or even mentioned, the deeper lying clitoral structures, yet every other structure of the human body was described in living detail. Even today with our relative sophistication of 1987, we are frequently whistled at by magazine headlines that promise breathless articles announcing the discovery of a new spot, a G-spot, an X-spot, located within the vagina. Within all these new spots exists the old wistful desire to deny the existence of the clitoris as a trigger organ of female orgasm. Why? There is the general traditional fear of female sexuality. Further, there is discomfort with the similarity, with the common origin, of the female clitoris and the male penis. Women are used to hearing the clitoris described as an undeveloped penis. Men are not used to thinking of the penis as an overdeveloped clitoris. Finally, and more seriously, there is a profound psychological and institutional reluctance to face the repercussions of the fact that the female clitoris is the only organ in the human body whose purpose is exclusively that of erotic stimulation and release. What does this mean? It means that for the human female, alone among all Earth's life forms, sexuality and reproduction are not inseparable. It is the male penis, carrier of both semen and sexual response, that is simultaneously procreative and erotic. If we wanted to reduce one of the sexes to a purely reproductive function on the basis of its anatomy, we don't, it would be the male sex that qualified for such a reduction, not the female, not the human female. But these are only biological facts. These are only biological realities. As we know, facts and realities can be and are systematically ignored in the service of established ideologies. Throughout the world today, virtually all religious, cultural, economic, and political institutions stand where they were built centuries ago on the solid foundation of an erroneous concept. A concept that assumes the psychic passivity, the creative inferiority, and the sexual secondariness of women. This enshrined concept states that men exist to create the human world while women exist to reproduce humans, period. If we argue that data exists, not solely biological, but archaeological, mythological, anthropological, and historical data, which refutes the universality of this erroneous concept, we are told to shut up, because something called God supports the erroneous concept, and that's all that matters. That's the final word. Throughout the world, throughout what we know of history, something called God has been used to support the denial, the condemnation, and the mutilation of female sexuality, of the female sex, ourselves. Today, in parts of Africa, predominantly among African Muslims, but also among African Christians and Jews and some tribal beliefs, young girls are still subjected to clitoridectomy. This surgery, often performed by older women with broken glass or knives, excises the clitoris, severing the nerves of orgasm. The operation is intended to force the girl to concentrate on her vagina as a reproductive vessel. Infibulation, a more thorough operation, removes the labia minora and much of the labia majora. The girl is then closed up with thorns or required to lie with her legs tied together until her entire vaginal orifice is fused shut, with a straw inserted to allow passage of urine and menstrual blood. On the wedding night, the young woman is slit open by a midwife or her husband. Further cutting and reclosing is performed before and after childbirth. Complications from these surgeries are numerous, including death from infection, hemorrhage, inability to urinate, scar tissue preventing dilation during labor, painful coitus, and infertility due to chronic pelvic infection. In 1976, an estimated 10 million women were involved with this operation, and something called God justified it. A god who supposedly created young girls as filthy sex maniacs who must then be mutilated to turn them into docile breeders. The word infibulation comes from the Latin fibula, meaning a clasp. Those civilized Romans, great highway builders, also invented the technology of fastening metal clasps through the prepuces of young girls to enforce chastity. This practice was copied by Christian crusaders during the early Middle Ages in Europe. They locked up their wives and daughters in metal chastity belts and then took the keys with them while they were gone, often for many years, fighting for God in the Near East. And lest through hypocrisy and racism we dismiss these practices as merely barbaric or ancient, we must recall that clitoridectomies were performed in the last century on young girls and women in both Europe and America. 
This surgery, very popular with 19th century Victorians, was inflicted on any female considered to be oversexed, or as a punishment for masturbation, or as a cure for madness. These determinations were all made by male relatives, male physicians, and male clerics, and the women involved had no legal say in the matter. These are extreme examples of the repression and mutilation of female sexuality, always sanctioned, however remotely and dishonestly, by something called God. All the other repressions and mutilations of the body, of the mind, of the soul, of our experienced female selves are so well known and documented that they need no numeration at this point. We can all make our own lists. The point is this. Wherever repression of female sexuality and of the female sex exists, and at the present writing this is everywhere on earth, we find the same underlying assumptions. These are ontological assumptions, assumptions made at the very root of things, about the nature of life itself. They are 1. That the world was created by a male deity figure, or God. 2. That existing world orders or cultures were made by and for men with God's sanction. 3. That females are an auxiliary sex who exist to serve and populate these male world orders. 4. That autonomous female sexuality poses a wild and lethal threat to these world orders and therefore must be controlled and repressed. And finally, 5. That God's existence as a male sanctions this repression. The perfect circularity or tautology of these assumptions only helps to bind them more securely around the human psyche. That they are as erroneous as they are universal seems to pose no problem to their upholders. After all, wherever we go on earth, every intact institution, religious, legal, governmental, economic, military, communications, and customs, is built on the solid slab of these assumptions, and that's a pretty entrenched error. In the post-World War II United States, as well as in Europe and most of the world generally, we've gone through a secularizing period in which some of these assumptions have been loosened up, and even been made to crumble under questioning. But now the backlash is upon us. Today, spokespeople for various fundamentalist religious beliefs use modern media to broadcast a very old idea, that female sexuality, i.e. feminists and feminist demands for abortion, contraception, reproductive autonomy, child care, equal pay, psychological integrity, constitutes a threat to our civilization, and this amounts to a blasphemy against God, horrors of Babylon, Darwin's theory of evolution, and the menace of world communism all somehow get subliminally mixed up in this feminist threat. For some very good historic and psychological reasons, which we will explore later. For now it is enough to say that God and civilization are loaded concepts, loaded with dynamite, that can always be brought in to end an argument that cannot otherwise be refuted. Or, for those who don't lean too heavily on God, or who major in civilization, you can always quote an anthropologist. For, just as established religions assume the maleness of God, just as Freud and psychoanalysis assume the maleness of libido, so have the social sciences, and in particular anthropology, assumed the generic maleness of human evolution. Both popular and academic anthropological writers have presented us with scenarios of human evolution that feature, almost exclusively, the adventures and inventions of man the hunter, man the tool maker, man the territorial marker, and so forth. Woman is not comprehended as an evolutionary or evolutionizing creature. She is treated rather as an auxiliary to the male-dominated evolutionary process. She mothers him, she mates him, she cooks his dinner, she follows around after him picking up loose rocks. He evolves, she follows. He evolutionizes, she adjusts. If the book jackets don't give us pictures of female homo sapiens being dragged by the hair through two or three million years of he-man evolution, we are left to assume that this was the situation. This, despite the known fact that among contemporary and historic hunting and gathering people, as among our remote hunting and gathering ancestors, 75 to 80 percent of the group's sustenance comes from the women's food gathering activities. This, despite the known fact that the oldest tools used by contemporary hunters and gatherers, and the oldest, most primal tools ever found in ancient sites, are women's digging sticks. This despite worldwide knowledge that cite women as the first users and domesticators of fire. This despite the known fact that women were the first potters, the first weavers, the first textile dyers, and hide tanners. The first to gather and study medicinal plants, i.e. the first doctors, and on and on. 
Observing the linguistic interplay between mothers and infants, mothers and children, and among work groups of women, it is easy to speculate on the female contribution to the origin and elaboration of language. That the first time measurements ever made, the first formal calendars, were women's lunar markings on painted pebbles and carved sticks is also known. And it is thoroughly known that the only god image ever painted on rock, carved in stone, or sculpted in clay, from the Upper Paleolithic to the Middle Neolithic, and that's roughly 30,000 years, was the image of a human female. In 1948, The Gate of Horn was published in Britain. In 1963, it was published in America, retitled Religious Conceptions of the Stone Age. In this pioneering work, archaeologist and scholar G. Rachel Levy showed the unbroken continuity of religious images and ideas descending from the Cro-Magnon people of the Upper Paleolithic period in Ice Age Europe through the Mesolithic and Neolithic developments in the Near East and down to our own historical time. As Levy noted, these early people are lost to us in the mists of time, but their primal visions, images, and gestalts of human experience on this planet still resonate in our psyches, as well as in our historic religious ontological symbols. These early Stone Age people bequeathed to all humanity a foundation of ideas upon which the mind could raise its structures. And what were these primal human images and ideas? The cave as the female womb, the mother as a pregnant earth, the magical fertile female as the mother of all animals, the Venus of Lossal standing with the horn of the moon upraised in her hand, the cave as the female tomb where life is buried, painted blood red and awaiting rebirth. Levy shows the continuity of these images and symbols through the late Neolithic Near Eastern rites and mythologies, and their endurance 30,000 years later in modern religions. In Christianity, for example, with its central image of the birth of the sacred child in a cave-like shelter surrounded by magic animals, and especially in Catholicism, the icon of the Great Mother who stands on the horned moon and awaits the rebirth of the world. The evidence leaves no doubt that these images were at the origins of what we call human psychological and spiritual expression. Levy's book is a masterpiece. It received great praise upon both its British and American publications, and has since been virtually bypassed and ignored by the anthropological, archaeological, academic establishments. Why? Because her evidence is irrefutable. It shows with clarity, and in the solidity of stone and bone, that the first 30,000 years of Homo sapiens' existence was dominated by a celebration of the female processes, of the mysteries of menstruation, pregnancy, and childbirth, of the analogous abundance of the earth, of the seasonal movement of animals and the cycles of time in the great round of the mother. The Gate of Horn is as close as we can come to reading the sacred book of our early human ancestors, and it confirms what too many people do not want to know, that the first god was female. Since Levy wrote, the tendency has been to relegate these old Stone Age and Neolithic images to the psychological realm, they've become archetypes of the unconscious, and so forth, while anthropological writers proper, both academic and popular, continue to explain physical, real human development solely in terms of the experiences of the male body in hunting, aggression, and tool-making. Thus, the female images, which are there and cannot be denied, are sideswept, reduced to the subjective, the mythic realms, and thus the first 30,000 years of our human history is denied to us, relegated to a mind trip or psychological software. Even among feminists in recent years, there has arisen doubt that these images and symbols might be anything but mythology, i.e. unrealities. To approach our human past and the female god, we need a wagon with at least two wheels. One is the mythical, historical, archaeological. The other is the biological, anthropological. A strong track has already been laid down for the mythical, historical, archaeological wheel. Milestones along that track, along with G. Rachel Levy's great work, are J. J. Bakovin's Myth, Religion, and Mother Right, Robert Brifault's The Mothers, Helen Diner's Mothers and Amazons, Jesse Weston's From Ritual to Romance, Robert Graves' The White Goddess, O.G.S. Crawford's The Eye Goddess, Sybil von Kless Redden's In the Realm of the Great Goddess, Michael Dame's Silbury Treasure and Avabury Cycle, Maria Gimbuta's The Goddesses and Gods of Old Europe, and most recently Elizabeth G. Davis's The First Sex, Merlin Stone's When God Was a Woman, and Ancient Mirrors of Womanhood. 
Phyllis Chesler's Women and Madness and About Men, Adrian Rich's Of Women Born, Mary Daly's Beyond God the Father, Gynecology and Pure Lust, Susan Griffin's Women in Nature, Anne Cameron's Daughters of Copper Women, and many, many more, including the richly useful Women's Encyclopedia of Myths and Secrets by Barbara G. Walker. The other side of our wagon, the biological anthropological side, has almost no wheel and no track, not because there is no important place to go in that direction, but because the physical cultural anthropologists are off somewhere else, busily mapping the evolution of Tarzan. There is no body of anthropological work based on the evolution of female biology. With rare exceptions, there have been no attempts whatsoever to study the evolution of human physiology and cultural organization, from pre-hominid to modern man from the perspective of the definitive changes undergone by the female in the process of that evolution. Popular books on this subject by Lionel Tiger, Desmond Morris et al. are invariably male-oriented, treating the evolution of the female as sex object only, from monkey and heat to hot bunny. One delightful exception is Elaine Morgan's The Descent of Woman. During 12 million years of dry Pliocene, Morgan speculates, the female prehominid took to the oceans, surviving in the warm and food-filled coastal waters, and during this experience underwent a sea change from knuckle-walking, rear-sex primate to upright human sexual body, to which the male primate responded by becoming man. Morgan argues convincingly that the human species survived the long Pliocene drought through the cooperation and social invention of the evolving hominid females in their adaptation to the sea. Academic experts ignore this theory, but they have no other explanation for our Pliocene survival, for our successful evolution from ape to man during this difficult period, or for the many ways in which our human bodies resemble the bodies of sea mammals rather than primates. In The Time Falling Bodies Take to Light, historian William Irvin Thompson points out that early human evolution occurred in three critical stages. One, hominization, in which our primate bodies became human, not only in walking upright and freeing the hands, but specifically in our sexual characteristics and functions. Two, symbolization, in which we began using speech, marking time, painting, and sculpting images. And three, agriculturalization, in which we domesticated seeds and began control of food production. And, as Thomas writes, all three stages were initiated and developed by the human female. The symbol-making and agricultural stages have been studied, and the originating role of women in these stages is known. It is sexual hominization which, as yet, has barely been explored. Why? Why indeed? Because sexual hominization is almost exclusively the story of the human female. The mechanics and anatomy of male sexuality, after all, haven't changed greatly since the primates made love. The revolution in human sexuality, the revolution that made us human, resulted from evolutionary changes that occurred in the female body. These changes were not primarily related to mammalian reproduction, but to human sexual relationship. No one knows the order in which they occurred, but taken together as an evolved cluster of sexual characteristics, they constitute a truly radical sexual metamorphosis undergone by the human female. Elimination of the estrus cycle and development of the menstrual cycle meant that women were not periodically in heat but capable of sexual activity at any time. Pregnancy could occur during a part of the cycle, but for most of the cycle, sex could happen without necessarily resulting in pregnancy. Among all other animals, the estrus cycle determines that copulation always results in pregnancy and has no other than a reproductive purpose. Development of the clitoris and evolution of the vagina meant a greatly enhanced sexuality and orgasmic potential in human females compared to all other animals. The change from rear to frontal sex, we can imagine, created an enormous change in relations between the sexes. Frontal sex means a prolonged and enhanced lovemaking period and what might be called the personalization of sex. The emotion-evoking role of face-to-face -face intercourse in the development of human sex consciousness has yet to be evaluated. She turned around and looked him in the eye, and there was light. Development of breasts added to women's potential for sexual arousal. Further, combined with frontal sex, no doubt the female's maternal and social feelings were also now aroused by the personal lover, whose body was now analogous to the infant's body at her breast. As Thompson points out, such radical changes in the female body alone were enough to trigger the hominization of the species. Human beings, with these changes, became the only creatures on earth for whom copulation occurs, can occur any time, for non-reproductive purposes. 
Human sex thus became a multi-purpose activity. It can happen for emotional bonding, for social bonding, for pleasure, for communication, for shelter and comfort, for personal release, for escape, as well as for reproduction of the species. And this is one of the original and major determining differences between humans and all other animals, birds, reptiles, insects, fishes, worms, for whom copulation exists only and solely for species reproduction. The human race has been definitively shaped by the evolution slash revolution of the female body into a capacity for non-reproductive sex. This is not just a physical fact, it is a cultural, religious, and political fact of primary significance. Many feminists today are unsure whether studies of evolutionary biology or of religious mythology can have political relevance for contemporary women. We believe that nothing could be more politically relevant than knowing why we got where we are now by seeing how we got here and where we began. In the beginning, the first environment for all new life was female, the physical slash emotional slash spiritual body of the mother and the communal body of women, young girls, grown women, older women working together. When hunting and gathering people move, the infant is carried bound close to the mother's body. When they settle, the women form an inner circle campsite of women and children. The socialization process begins here. Human culture is marked by a strengthening and prolongation of the relation between mothers and offspring. For its first year, the human child is virtually an embryo outside the womb, extremely vulnerable and totally dependent. Female group behavior, the cooperative care sharing among mothers and children, older and younger women, in the tasks of daily life, emerges from the fact of this prolonged dependence of the human child on the human female for its survival. Males help, but they also leave. The male body comes and goes, but the female presence is constant. Females train, discipline, and protect the young. Beyond infant care, the maintenance and leadership of the entire kin group is the task of women. The female animal is always on the alert, for on her rests the responsibility not only of feeding the young, but of keeping the young from being food for others. She is the giver and also the sustainer of beginning life. Among humans, males help with protection and food acquisition, but it is the communal group of females that surrounds the child in its first four to six years of life, with a strong physical, emotional, traditional, and linguistic presence, and this is the foundation of social life and human culture. The popular image of early human societies being dominated, indeed created, by sexist male hunters and ferocious territorial headbangers just doesn't hold water. If the first humans had depended solely on despotic and aggressive male leaders, or on several males in chronic ritualistic contention for power, human society would never have developed. Human culture could have never been invented. The human presence on earth would never have evolved. The fact is that it was from this first inner circle of women, the campsite, the firesite, the cave, the first hearth, the first cycle of birth, that human society evolved. As hominids evolved into Paleolithic Homo sapiens and then into settled and complex Neolithic village people on the time edge of civilization, these tens of thousands of years of human culture were shaped and sustained by communities of creative, sexually and psychically active women. Women who were inventors, producers, scientists, physicians, lawgivers, visionary shamans, artists. Women who were also the mothers, receivers and transmitters of terrestrial and cosmic energy. We have to understand how and why these ancient millennia of women cultures have been buried, ignored, denied, passed off as mythology or primitive prehistoric origins by Western male historians who insist, and often really believe, that real history began only about 5,000 years ago with the relatively recent institutions of patriarchy.